morning, everybody. It is 7 o'clock here in the UK. You are very welcome to spend your breakfast with us here at Sky News this morning. Petrol stations in some parts of the country have run out of fuel this morning after a weekend which saw panic buying and scuffles on forecourts. We'll have the latest on this developing story as the government considers calling in the army to help and appeals to retired lorry drivers to save the day. We'll talk to the Petrol Retailers Association plus the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan. Also this morning, we'll talk to the Shadow Chancellor, Rachel Reeves, as a row over the Deputy Labour leader, Angela Rayner's comments calling Conservatives scum overshadows the party conference. And are you planning a last-minute getaway but not quite sure what the new rules are or indeed where to go? We'll be answering all of your holiday questions live with travel experts Claire Ovin and Simon Calder. 9.45, so do send us your questions. Oh, who wouldn't want to be doing that right now? Monday, 27th of September. Pumped up as petrol runs out at some garages around the country, causing anger and long queues. The government considers calling in the army. I do Uber, so it's quite difficult for me. You know, I need, I need, I need petrol, and obviously there's not a lot around. So, you know, if if I don't get petrol, I don't get no food. I'm live at a petrol station in West London, which is expecting a delivery this morning after a weekend of panic buying led to fights on forecourts and large queues at pumps. I'm live at the Labour Party conference in Brighton as the party tries to move on from its infighting. Meanwhile, government ministers are embroiled in more talks to try and fix the fuel crisis. And I'm live in Berlin as the results of the German election come in. Angela Merkel's party have been overtaken uh, by the left of centre SPD, but it's not certain that their man, Olaf Scholz, will be the next Chancellor. I'm live in La Palma as some evacuated residents are able to go home, but with a warning, the volcano could continue erupting for weeks. Fastlane to jail, our environmental campaign has prepared to break an injunction to keep protesting on the M25 like these scenes last week. We'll talk to Insulate Britain. Morning, if you're driving to work this morning and need fuel, will you be able to fill up the tank. Petrol stations in some parts of the country have basically run dry. The government now says it's considering calling in the army to help after a weekend of panic buying. A shortage of lorry drivers has led to fuel supply issues for garages, with the government appealing for retired drivers to come back and save the day. Emergency measures were triggered last night by the business secretary, Kwasi Kwarteng, who chose to suspend competition laws for the fuel industry to allow companies to work together to target filling stations running low. Milena Vysilivovic reports. A rush to fill up the tank for the working week. Days into this crisis, there's no sign of let-up. And those queuing say they have no other choice. I need it for work and we have a very important week this week. And it is, it's imperative that I do have fuel for, for, the, for, the, for, for the journeys that I have to take. And I'm a carer for my mum and everything as well, so it's quite important for me to be able to get to and from places. So. Yeah, it's been difficult. I'm a PCO driver. I, I do I do Uber, so it's quite difficult for me. You know, I need I need I need petrol, and obviously there's not a lot around. So, you know, if if I don't get petrol, I don't get no food. That's the way I look at it. This station usually serves cab drivers, but it's run dry, and it's starting to affect their livelihood. You imagine you get a good job going to Bristol or Reading. How are you going to manage? If our people like they are turning down the jobs, the big jobs like Bristol, like. Uh, Manchester, we can't, we can't do it because everybody knows that you can go, but how, there's no guarantee you're going to get fuel coming back to London. There are calls to prioritise key workers like home carers, many of whom say they can't get to their vulnerable patients. Some of them were very distressed by the fact that they couldn't get fuel because they were trying to get to people that they're supporting on end-of-life care, for example, who had time-critical pain med med medication to give. And once they get behind on their rotors, it's very, very difficult then to catch up. 
The government has suspended competition laws so companies can work together to restock petrol stations. But that won't solve the severe shortage of HGV drivers, which is the cause of the problem. The average age of a lorry driver is 55, and 2,000 of them leave the industry each week, according to the Road Haulage Association, and only 1,000 new recruits replace them. Poor quality of life on the road is partly to blame, insiders say. This is a cocktail of problems as to why people don't want to do it anymore. But the conditions out on the road for safety is one thing, for parking safely and um, for being able to find facilities for themselves where they can wash their hands, go to the bathroom, have a shower. We need to address that. Until a chronic shortage of drivers is tackled, more supply chain crunches could lie ahead. Milena Veselinovic, Sky News. Joining us now is the head of the UK Petrol Retailers Association, Brian Madison. Hello to you, Brian. Thanks for joining us. What sort of mess are we in? I think there is some good news, Kay, that in Northern Ireland there's been no panic buying, fuel supplies are normal and uh, no issues to report. And the same in parts of rural Scotland and rural Wales. So it looks as though the panic buying has really been uh, exacerbated in the main urban centres particularly in England, where some of our members, the larger groups with a portfolio of sites, uh, report 50% are dry as of yesterday. Some even report as many as 90% dry yesterday. So you can see that it is quite acute. We represent the independent dealers with the major fuel brands, BP, Shell, Jet and so on. Uh, we don't represent uh, the uh, supermarkets, nor the old company site. But certainly for our members, uh, Monday morning is going to start a dry for them. Whose fault is it? The whistleblower who leaked a confidential BP report to the Cabinet uh, meeting on the 16th of September, which was picked up by a main broadcaster and uh, broadcast last Wednesday. And uh, immediately that happened, uh, there was panic buying from Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and yes, some of the volumes. I mean, one of our members uh, who's got a very large site, he reported 500% more volume sales last Saturday than the previous Saturday. So people have not been going and buying their normal 20 pounds, 20 litres uh, to get them through the week. They've actually been topping up every time. And of course, with 36 million vehicles on the road, the capacity in their tanks is way more than we have underground on the floor. Shouldn't the public know if there's a, going to be a, a problem, though? Uh, is, is it reasonable to criticise the whistleblower? Yes, I think so, because it was being uh, entirely well contained at that point by industry. Uh, and by government who were moving towards uh, some solution. So we really just didn't need this um, whistle uh, to set off panic buying and cause the mayhem that we now have. I think it was completely an utter irresponsible action. So what's the solution now? What do we do? Given we are where we are, what happens next? There are no big levers, Kate, Paul, but the series of small levers which industry and government are now looking towards, which includes, as uh, your programme has mentioned, the possibility of military drivers. However, that is not quite as easy as you think because the HGV tanker drivers are a highly trained, specialised breed. They've got 42,000 litres of highly inflammable liquid They're moving around the country from terminal to full block. And they do the loading from the gantry uh, into their tanker, and they do the discharge when they get to the fork. And they need to be certain that they're putting the right fuel into the right pot in the fork, because as we know, petrol and diesel, diesel and petrol, may cause havoc with your engine within a few hundred yards of leaving the fork. So we can't immediately take the military drivers uh, without first sorting out the loading of the country and the filling up the there are possibilities of bringing back uh, drivers from the continent, but there are HGV shortages right across the continent. Germany, Poland, Italy, France, they've all got problems. So 
quite how many we can attract back just for three months. And that's all the government are allowing in their temporary exemption visas from the 1st of October till the end of the year. How many will come back in that timescale and how many will immediately be efficient? We're not quite certain. One of the issues, though, is with the DVLA, the Driver and Vehicle Licensing Agency. It said that they are sitting on 40,000 applications by UK citizens for an HGV driver um, license. And they have had strikes this year down in Swansea. Uh, they have had working from home. But whatever is going on, it's completely unacceptable performance. And this is the responsibility of Grant Shapps' department, the Department of Transport. And I just wonder whether he's actually ever been to Swansea to try and sort out the mess that we've got. All of this sounds like it's going to be quite a long and laborious process. How long before we won't have to queue for fuel anymore? Well, hopefully, a lot of cars have now got a lot of fuel in. And, and instead of having half a tank, they've got a full tank. So we are watching and waiting uh, from probably about Wednesday onwards to see whether there is a dissipation in the volume of traffic coming in to Falkworth trying to fill up. But of course, this thing is self-prophesying. If you need fuel for work, to take the kids to school, to go and visit Granny in her care home, um, fuel absolutely is essential around the UK. And what we've seen, strangely, is that the market for second-hand cars has been going up every month. Normally it goes down, of course, but every month it's been going up because people are afraid of using public transport. So they're buying themselves a little banger for four or five thousand pounds and using that to get to work and do their daily routines. And so there's possibly a bit more traffic on the road than we've had hitherto. Um, so, but just to answer my question in a nutshell, um, Brian, you think that we should be back to normal by the end of this week? I'm keeping my fingers crossed that it will be less of a problem by the end of this week. OK, thank you very much indeed for joining us, Mr Madison. Appreciate you taking the time ahead of UK's Petrol Retailers Association. Thank you. Well, um, yeah, a bit of a crisis going on, isn't there? We requested to speak to a minister about the crisis this morning, but they've told us that they won't be putting any ministers forward for morning interviews during Labour Party conference. Aisha Zaid is at a petrol station in West London for us this morning, which has run out of fuel, but is expecting a delivery imminently. And what will the politicians do next? We're waiting to hear if there's a cabinet this morning. Tomorrow Cohen is in Brighton at the Labour Party conference. Aisha, to you first of all, it looks as though they've got some fuel again, have they, behind you? Yeah, that's right. The delivery has arrived in the last few moments and you can see people starting to fill up. Now, a massive queue has built here in the past hour. Uh, cars queuing all the way down, blocking parts of the A4 as well. Uh, now, they initially ran out of fuel here last night around 10 p.m., but that didn't stop cars from coming overnight, uh, passing through, trying their luck to see if they were able to fill up. It has definitely felt busier since five o'clock and six o'clock this morning. Queues were building even when there were no, uh, when there was no fuel here. And some of these cars have been waiting several hours. Now, speaking to some of the drivers this morning, it's been uh, a mix of reasons as to why they're here. Some people desperate to fill up before they head to work and others panic buying. But it's important to note that the problem isn't with a shortage of fuel. It's a problem with getting the fuel to the forecourts due to a lack of HGV drivers. And over the weekend, we know the government held emergency talks about the issue. Uh, so, and, so at the moment, there is still massive, massive problems on the forecourt. OK, thanks. Tomorrow, as I said, also um, in Brighton. That will be a topic of conversation tomorrow in uh, Brighton. They have other issues to deal with as well. Good morning. Good morning, Kay. Yes, Labour have so far said what they would do is give visas to 100,000 foreign lorry drivers to come in and try and uh, sort this out. At the moment, the government are considering still whether they bring in uh, members of the armed forces to drive petrol tankers. So far, all these entreaties to everybody to not panic buy petrol uh, have still led to big queues at forecourts and a number of petrol stations uh, actually closed. Uh, what has developed over the last 24 hours 
hours or so. The business secretary, Kwasi Kwarteng, has met, has spoken to uh, the big fuel companies and decided to suspend competition law. What this means is that the different companies that supply petrol will be able to share information with each other about where the bottlenecks are and actually deliver to each other's forecourts. So that should help a bit at the margins, is what I'm told by senior people in government, but certainly talks between ministers. It won't be a full cabinet meeting, but talks between ministers will be continuing today. Uh, and as far as Labour is um, concerned, we're going to be speaking to Rachel Reeves a little bit um, later on, uh, but they're embroiled in a bit of a row, aren't they? That's right, Kay. Um, a bit, bit of infighting, dominating proceedings over the weekend as Keir Starmer tried to get through some big changes to the rules about how Labour elects its future leaders. I think we could broadly say that these are intended to prevent a left-wing Jeremy Corbyn-style leader uh, coming in in future. He did actually get those through last night, looked a bit uh, dicey at times, but he'll be very relieved by that. And today they're trying to get the focus back onto policy with Rachel Reeves, who wants to be the next Chancellor of the Exchequer, saying if Labour were elected, they would scrap business rates, the taxes paid by high street shops, which they say put them at an unfair disadvantage to the likes of Amazon. But where do they find that £30 billion? OK, thank you. I'll be speaking to Rachel uh, Reeve later on in uh, the programme. Now, a word about a new programme starting on Sky News and Sky Showcase this evening. Trevor Phillips can tell us more. Their headlines from another generation, food and fuel shortages, Rising taxes, warnings of a winter of discontent. But this is the UK today. Every Monday, we'll be discussing the topic dominating the news and we'll be putting you in charge on The Great Debate. This week, is Britain running on empty? And you can watch The Great Debate tonight, 9 o'clock on Sky Showcase and here, of course, on Sky News. Still to come on the programme for you, half past seven, going to be speaking to the boxer Amir Khan about claims that he was removed from a flight in the US after a reported row over face coverings. 20 to 8, I'm going to be joined by Insulate Britain to discuss the injunction which bans them from blocking the M25 motorway. What are they going to do about that? And then at quarter to eight, we'll head down to Brighton, as I said, to speak to the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, as the Labour Party enters the third day of its annual conference. The preliminary results in the German elections are in, with the Social Democrats taking a narrow lead. Um, those early results suggesting the centre-left, SPD, will win the largest share of the vote, with around 26%. Close behind is the CDU with 24%. The Greens are next with 14%, while the pro-business Free Democratic Party are on 11 The two parties are expected to be key to forming any coalition. Finally, the far-right AFD party are projected to win 10% of the vote. So, as it stands, the SPD has the largest share of the vote. Sounds pretty complicated, doesn't it? Our editor-at-large, Adam Bolton in Berlin. He'll clear it all up for us right now. Hi, Adam. A very good morning. A lot of acronyms there. What does it all mean? Well, uh, what it really means, Kay, is, first of all, we don't need to keep talking about preliminary results. We know the pattern of the night, and the pattern of the night is, is that the equivalent of the Labour Party, the SPD, uh, have taken the largest share of the votes. Uh, their vote is up fairly dramatically. They've overtaken Angela Merkel's old party, the CDU, CSU, the centre-left Christian Democrats, centre-right Christian Democrats. Uh, so it's been a bad night for them, and their vote is down considerably. We also know that the Greens uh, have done pretty well. Now, because Germany has a proportional representation system, uh, it's not first past the post, so the SPD won't be able to form a government. They need uh, to get a majority of seats behind them in the uh, German parliament behind me. Uh, that means there's going to have to be a coalition. That will involve at least three parties to get over the 50%. And just the way the maths work, uh, there is a possibility that the party which has come second, Angela Merkel's own party, could uh, assemble 
a, a majority itself, excluding the party which has actually come first, the SPD. It's more likely uh, that the SPD, though, uh, will manage to form a coalition, probably uh, with the Liberals, the FDP, and with the Greens uh, in second place. But if the Liberals and the Greens decided that they wanted to go uh, with Angela Merkel's old grouping of the CDU-CSU, uh, they uh, could technically do that. But uh, I think we need to calm down a bit. The fact is the momentum is with the SPD. Uh, we're going to hear from them later on this morning. And their leader is Olaf Schulz. Now, he is 63 and uh, he's well known to Germans. I mean, he is currently serving as the finance minister and also uh, the deputy chancellor. And he looks like the man uh, assuming the parties can agree over what's likely to be weeks of uh, uh, negotiations. He looks like the man who will be the next Chancellor. Uh, and that coalition which he's going to have to form in order to take office uh, is likely to be uh, a partnership with uh, Annalena Baerbock. Uh, she is the leader of the Greens. She apologised for them not doing better and blamed her own mistakes, but she will probably be the Deputy Chancellor. And then the Liberals, the yellow in this traffic light coalition, the F DP. They're led by uh, Christian Linder, who's a good uh, communicator. Uh, they are initially going to talk to each other, the Greens and the Liberals, to decide which of the uh, two big parties they're going to approach first about forming a three-way coalition. OK, Adam, see, I told you to explain it all for you. Thanks very much indeed, Adam, live in Berlin. Thank you. He's so clever. Now, what about this? Alan Lancaster, do you remember him? Of course you do, the bass guitarist and founding member of Status Quo. He's died at the age of 72. Let's take a listen to one of their famous tunes. He really did rock all over the world, from Germany to Japan, California to Copenhagen, and of course, an endless list of iconic performances on home soil. That was actually Nebworth in 1990, performing in front of many tens of thousands of fans. The band's singer Francis Rossi has led tributes, calling his colleague an integral part of status quo's sound and success over the years. That pub quiz question, remember, of course, who opened Live Aid back in the 80s at Wembley? Yep. Let's take a look at the other stories making news this morning. The internet provider TalkTalk Talk is rolling out a new scheme giving UK job seekers free broadband. The initiative, which is backed by the government, has come about as recruitment processes and training has moved online due to the pandemic. Job seekers will be offered a six-month voucher for unlimited internet usage. Campaigners in San Marino are celebrating after the country voted to legalise abortion, overturning a 150-year-old law in the process. Some 77% of voters approved a referendum proposal calling for abortion to be legal in the first 12 weeks of pregnancy, according to official results. Authorities in two Indian coastal states are on high alert, with evacuations and preparations underway as a cyclone hit the eastern seaboard. The Indian Meteorological Department says Cyclone Gulab, coming in from the Bay of Bengal, began to make landfall late on Sunday evening with wind speeds of up to 59 miles an hour. Some residents on the island of La Palma have been allowed back home to collect their belongings after evacuating from their homes because of an erupting volcano. Airport workers have cleared the runway of volcanic ash, thankfully, but all flights to and from La Palma have uh, remained cancelled. Scientists say the eruption, which is the island's first in 50 years, could last for another three months. Well, these were some of the latest pictures of the devastation caused by the volcano from yesterday. Churches and homes were destroyed by the streams of lava after a new vent opened up on the volcano over the weekend. Live pictures of the volcano right now showing lava spewing out into the air on La Palma. As I said, another visit, um, Fisio, I should say, opened up over the weekend. Becky Cottrell joining us from La Palma now. Hello to you, Becky. What's it looking like there? Good morning. You have to wear a face covering, don't you, because of the ash in the air? 
You do, yeah, that's the advice for everyone here to wear these medical grade masks to protect from the ash and those gases. The volcano this morning is slightly calmer than it was yesterday when we were here. We know that the pressure inside the volcano decreased over the weekend, but that doesn't mean the eruptions are about to stop. We simply don't know when that will happen. And just in the time we've been here, you can see these kind of intermittent explosions of lava from the top of the volcano. And we know that lava is flowing th freely through towns. You just mentioned that church. That is in a town called Todoke. It's about three miles south of the volcano. Over a thousand people live there. And actually last week that church had a near miss. The lava stream stopped just short of it. Seems now it look, its look has sadly run out. But there will be many people in that town and in evacuation zones from across the island who are eager to get back home and see just how bad the damage is. OK, for now, thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, let's have a look at some of these uh, amazing pictures. Um, a bit of a daring endeavour. Here we go. Cliff diving. World champion Gary Hunt and Rhiannon Ifland added to their Hall of Titles during an event along Italy's Adriatic coastline over the weekend. Large crowds gathered to cheer on the participants during the season-ending finale on Sunday. And they did brilliantly, didn't they? Good for them. A uh, quick look at the weather. We are entering a more autumnal spell. Certainly felt like it this morning. Prolonged rain giving way to widespread showers today. Hello again, everybody. Heading to work this morning. Only got a quarter of a tank. We'll be speaking to a petrol station owner in just a moment. But before that, I want to share this with you. The boxer, Amir Khan, he's revealed that he was removed from a flight in the US after a reported row over face coverings. He's uh, 34, he was travelling on an American Airlines plane along with a colleague last week. So what on earth happened? Amir is joining us now from where he's uh, in training camp in Colorado Springs. Thanks for staying up for us, Amir. We really appreciate it. Tell me what happened on that plane. So um, I got on the plane and um, I was sat on seat number 1A and 1B was my friend, who, my colleague who was coming to training camp with me. And um, as soon as I was on the plane, I was on, the, I was, I was on a phone call. Um, the, the lady came over to the stewardess and said to me to go up, to, take, to put my phone call down, which I did. I put it down, didn't argue. I had my mask on, everything was fine. My friend um, must have been drinking some water, put his mask down a little bit, had a sip of water. Uh, the lady then came and said, please, you need to put your mask up. He had, it, must, it must have been just a little bit lower than his, um, just below his nose. And um, so he fixed that. And then the plane's moving now. So I'm, I'm leaning on the side of the window and fall, trying to fall asleep. Um, I was on the way to Colorado for my training camp and then the plane for some reason stops and when it stops um, I, I pull up the window just to see what's happened and um, before you know it the doors open up and three officers walk in and um, the, the air stewardess tells us to please can you leave for, um, can me and my friend leave I had done that, nothing wrong you know I mean my mask was always up I just didn't feel that I got treated so badly. Um, it was quite embarrassing standing up uh, in front of a full plane. And I think even they were shocked that, you know, why are the police in, in the airplane and why are they taking those two young boys who were literally sat right at the front? And um, we got literally taken out and um, they just said that we were not paying attention to instructions they've given us. They said that my bag, one of their press releases have come around, they said that the bag, my bag was out and I wasn't listening. I was arguing with them, which I never did. I didn't argue with them. And my bag was in the uh, storage area at the top of the, at the top uh, luggage area. Um, I just feel like, you know, I was just treated really badly. It was a week after 9-11. And I do feel like, you know, Things were a little bit tense, but to be picked on, two Asian boys that sat at the front, being pulled out in front of a full plane, it was quite embarrassing, really. Um, afterwards, I spoke to the officers and they said the same thing. They go, look, it's always an issue with American Airlines. And since I've posted it, because I had to post it because I felt like I was just treated really wrongly and really badly. And um, 
I mean, so, if my I mean, colleagues... Just, just to clarify, you feel that you were asked to get off the plane because of the colour of your skin and it was a week after 9-11? I'm, I'm not saying that, but I think it might have something to do with that. Um, maybe peop maybe the air stewardesses and, and the people, the, the staff didn't feel comfortable me being there sat at the front. I mean, there was no arguments, there was no shouting or anything. I, I, obviously, I'm a very quiet guy and I respect when they give the instructions, I respect that. And when they told me to put the phone down, which is the only incident, I had when I was on the phone, they said to me, put the phone call, call down, and we're going to be leaving right. soon, and I, and I put it down. Okay, but, I mean, yeah, this, is I what, this is what American Airlines said. Um, I just want to put this to you. Prior to takeoff on the 18th of September, American Airlines Flight 700, with service from Newark Liberty International Airport to Dallas Fort Worth, returned to the gate to deplane two customers who reportedly refused to comply with repeated crew member requests to stow luggage, place cell phones in airplane mode, and adhere to federal face covering requirements. Our customer relations team has reached out to Mr Khan to learn more about his experience. So that's their um, understanding of what happened. Have you spoken to them since? We spoke to them once when I just got to Colorado. Um, but at that time, by that time, I was already banned from flying any uh, American Airlines flight. And also I was banned from, is it One World, which is the company that runs American Airlines. And when I spoke to the colleague, he said he's going to go into... When I spoke to the American Airlines guy, he said to me that he's going to get back to me. Obviously, I had no response back from the American Airlines team. But honestly speaking, I was my phone was on airplane mode. When I was asked to put the phone down once, that was just once, I did put it down. And repeatedly, they said that they were telling me to put my, put my mask up. My mask was always up. So I'm sure the plane has um, cameras on... On there, I don't know if they do have them on planes, but really they need to check. I mean, there was people sat next to us, and they was in a little bit of a shock when the police came in to take us out. I mean, we felt like criminals, you know, they like like we had done something wrong the way we were dragged out of the plane. And then later on, when they recognised me, when the policeman recognised me, they took a selfie with me, and obviously the masks were off then as well. And that was obviously in the airport. But I just feel that. You know, um, having two police cars parked outside the airplane, like, like with some criminals, or like we are gonna do something. I mean, it just felt really uncomfortable and has definitely put me off. I mean, I got to train come quite late, um, and you know, my trainer was obviously upset with me coming there late. But it is what it is. I mean. Yeah. I'm just, I mean, when you were I, talking I about it, Amir, on, on Twitter, I mean, you did use the hashtag not all terrorists. So you you did feel that it was racially motivated, did you? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I, I, I'm going to stand by that because obviously, um, you know, being 9-11 a week before that and then having two Asian boys sat at the front, you know, you're going to think, who are these young boys? Um, and, and, and they're angry Asian as well. And obviously... It makes it a little bit hard, but I hope I'm wrong. Um, but honestly speaking, I had done nothing wrong. Um, I got just kicked off a plane for no reason and was embarrassed in front of okay. a couple of hundred well, people. You know, we've given American Airlines the right to reply via their statement. Um, just tell me quickly about um, training, Colorado Springs. What's going on? It's really good. I mean, I've just got here and I'm doing a couple of, a couple of weeks here um, training. Hopefully I should be fighting... Uh, either end of the year or early next year. I want to have one or two more fights before I call it a day. And uh, being up here, you know, the altitude is amazing. Um, and literally, it is hard work. I mean, just to get your breath is a lot harder. Um, one round feels like 10 rounds. So I'm just enjoying training and with a new coach over here as well. So he's get, I'm getting to know what he's like and how, what he can teach me and how he can improve my style. So you're saying one or two more fights and then it's all over for you? Yeah, I've been in the game a very long time. I've been in the game. I've been on the scene since I was 17 from the Olympic from the Olympic Games in 04 Olymp in, in Athens, 2004. And I am getting on a bit, a little bit now. I'm I'm, I'm touching 35, 35 in December. So you're a baba. You're a baba. Um, quick thought before I let you go about AJ getting beat. Yeah, I mean, no one ever expected that. You know, Andy Joshua is a great champion. And, you know, he, I'm sure he's going to go back to the drawing board and see where he made the mistakes and he's going to come back stronger. I mean, look, this is boxing for you. You win some, you lose some. But he needs to, you know, have his chin up high and, you know, 
he's going to get a lot of hate, which comes with the territory. Uh, he's a huge name in boxing, and I just hope he comes back stronger and he gets the rematch against Uzek and wins his titles back. I mean, yeah, I mean, look, um, he did seem a little bit slow in the fight. He would get caught a little bit too much. But well, I'm sure he can, he can fix that and he can come back stronger. OK. Um, you stayed up late for us. We appreciate it. Uh, get some sleep and hopefully we'll speak to you soon. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Uh, let's return to the crisis here at home, should we? The government now saying that it is considering bringing in the army to help deliver fuel across the country after a weekend of panic buying at the pumps. Earlier, I spoke to the chairman of the Petrol Retailers Association, Brian Madison, who told me that stations in big cities are the worst hit, and he was uh, in no uncertain terms about who was to blame. Some of our members, the larger groups with a portfolio of sites, uh, report 50% are dry as of yesterday. Some even report as many as 90% dry. Whose fault is it? The whistleblower who leaked a confidential BP report to the Cabinet uh, meeting on the 16th of September, which was picked up by a main broadcaster and uh, broadcast last Wednesday. And uh, immediately that happened, uh, there was panic buying from Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and yes, some of the volumes. I mean, one of our members uh, who's got a very large site, he reported 500% more volume sales last Saturday than the previous Saturday. Should we? Uh, Paul is a Texaco petrol station owner, joins us now. Hello to you, Paul. Thanks for joining us. What's it like where you are this morning? Good morning. Well, we're empty this morning, so... We've kept a bit of fuel for key workers, um, and that's all we've got. But it was just, it was manic at the weekend. It was panic buying. Um, I, I don't really think there's any need for panic buying at all, uh, but we're in a bad, bad place at the moment. When are you going to get more fuel? Do you know, Paul? So I think we've been programmed in for Friday now, so we'll have a week now with no fuel. Um, but, you know, there was... Four, 450% increase at the weekend, and we were refusing people all day yesterday. Um, but I think, you know, if this was on the cards and it was it was going to happen, where was the support before that? Um, do you think that calling in the army is a good idea? Well, I think the government needs to step up measures now because there's a lot of people without fuel that need fuel. And how do they get fuel and how do they get to work? How do they get the kids to school and so forth? So I think he needs to do right by the country and, and step up the measures. Um, who's to blame, do you think, for this, um, these queues? I was going to call it panic buying, but I'm leading the witness by saying that. Who do you, who do you think is to blame? Well, look, this has been going on for weeks. I think, you know, what started from last week has just exploded. Um, and everyone's mm. just got... They're, they're concerned now. Everyone wanted fuel over the weekend. And are you critical of, of motorists for thinking, I've got to get some fuel in my car, otherwise I won't be able to get the kids to school and I won't be able to get to work on Monday? Or are you um, cross about the fact that we've not had enough lorry drivers since um, June, apparently, is when Grant Shapps, the Transport Secretary, knew about it, and little has been done? What do you think? Well, look, this has been going on for a long time. It's not just with fuel. So I know with our convenience store as well that we've been short of so many products throughout this year compared to what we were when we were through the pandemic last year. Um, and there is a shortage of lorry drivers. Um, and, you know, there's, there's new rules, there's new regulations, apparently, that we've been told. Um, and there's nothing being really done about it. So whether there's more drivers now coming back from the EU or we've got the army on the road, I think you need to put a fix in. So I was chatting to... Um... The guy who's in charge of the Petrol Retailers Association, um, pe uh, looking after people like you, Paul, and he was saying he's got his fingers crossed that the situation will be more or less back to normal by the end of the week. Do you agree? Well, I hope, well, I hope so. I mean, look, Brian does a fantastic job there at the PRA. Um, and, you know, if that's what Brian's saying, I'm pretty comfortable with what Brian's saying, and I hope it does. Uh, look, this is Monday morning. Um, you know, the site's empty. Um, so, you know, I don't know what we do this week. And what do people do? They've only got, you know, a few miles left in their tank. I'm guessing they have no alternative but to queue up, do they? Yeah, but look, I think, you know, you've got to be sensible about it as well. So, you know, we, we, we weren't allowing jerry cans to be filled up. 
You've seen some incidents on the news where people have been trying to fill up in plastic bags. There's been fighting on the pumps. There was no need for none of that. Just put in what you need and there's no need to panic by. OK, um, good luck. I hope that you get your fuel on Friday and things get back to normal very quickly, Paul. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Um, you saw the live pictures there from um, West London as well, didn't you, where people are once again queuing apparently something like 500% increase in the demand for fuel at the forecourt over the weekend. This is what it's looking like at one fuel station, BP, with the colour of it, I'm thinking, isn't it? I think that is BP. Um, at um, the moment, just uh, queuing, sometimes for hours, people queuing either at 7 o'clock in the morning, 10 o'clock at night, to try and get fuel. And we're being told that there isn't a shortage of fuel. Well, there clearly is. But the problem is getting it from the refineries to the pump. Um, don't panic is what we're being told, although the Prime Minister and some government ministers meeting, we believe, later on today to decide whether the only option at this stage is to bring in our army drivers to move fuel around the country to where it's needed most. Meantime, the Russian President Vladimir Putin has gone on a fishing and hiking holiday in Siberia. Mr Putin was joined by the Defence Minister, his regular holiday companion, for the short break earlier this month. The Russian leader is known for his love of the great outdoors and has often been pictured bare-chested in an apparent bid to cultivate his macho image. It's quite a little fish, though, isn't it? Um, we'll be uh, talking uh, about that uh, in more detail later on in the programme. Before all of that, though, we want to take you back down to Labour Party conference and joining us from there is the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, in just a moment. Hello again, you are watching The Breakfast Show here on Sky News. A big issues this morning if you're trying to get uh, fuel. Long queues already developing. Um, we've got uh, images for you um, at a petrol station, BP station in West London, where people um, have been queuing since the early hours of this morning, chatting to a petrol station owner in Coventry. He's run out of fuel not getting any until Friday. The government will be a meeting, or certainly some members of the government meeting later on today, to decide whether now is the time to um, enrol army drivers to move fuel from the refineries to the forecourt. Joining us now from Brighton, where Labour Party conference is underway, is the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan. Hello to you, Mr Khan. Thank you for joining us. We look at pictures like that um, at petrol stations in your city this morning. Oh, what are your thoughts? Uh, we're hearing stories across London of uh, petrol stations running out of uh, petrol. Uh, our emergency services and our buses have enough, and they've got some in reserve. But we're hearing stories about care workers, people who work in hospitals who need their car to get hospital, uh, black cab drivers, uh, private hire vehicle uh, drivers not being able to fuel up uh, and provide the services uh, that our city needs, but also to enable people to uh, get to work. So we're working with the DFT to do what we can to make sure we have uh, fuel being provided, particularly for those key workers across our city. Um, who's to blame? Uh, a number of reasons uh, have led to this shambolic situation. We knew in 2016, by the way, there'd be a shortage of uh, haulage drivers uh, when Brexit happened. We knew during the pandemic that there was a problem training up uh, new haulage drivers because obviously proximity meant you couldn't keep uh, the, the training taking place without breaching social distances. Uh, we knew for some time this was going to happen and today you're announcing uh, that the government's talking about bringing the army in and it'll take some days for them to mobilise. The government yet again have taken their eye off the ball and it's ordinary people who are suffering. Yeah, although we did see, you know, challenges with Labour previously, didn't we? Um, looking back this morning, I didn't realise it was as far back as 1990, but Tony Blair had a similar issue to deal with. Obviously, it was a different reason why there wasn't fuel at the pumps, but it took a week or so for Labour to, to fix it. It was 2000, and uh, we did fix it. And one of the things we did in 2000, the government, is made sure some petrol stations were reserved for those key workers. The government made sure... Uh, there was a plan in place to uh, provide fuel. But also, uh, the difference was, this was telegraphed uh, back in 2016 uh, during the referendum campaign, but also in advance of us leaving the European Union. Some of us warned the government that, look, there's going to be a labour shortage as well as a skills shortage. One of the things I've been calling for since last January 
when the transition period ending, ended was um, a, a visa for those workers we need. But also, I've been saying for some time since the pandemic uh, uh, began that we need a COVID recovery visa because not just in haulage, in hospitality, in culture, in construction, those that pick our fruits, there's a desperate shortage of labour. And unless the government realises that many of our industries need this new labour, we're going to carry on seeing these sorts of problems in other sectors. Do you think that um, Boris Johnson is scum like Angela Rayner does? Well, that, those are not the words uh, that I would use. Uh, but I understand uh, Angela's anger and the passion she comes from. Uh, she's seen on a regular basis those in her residential homes, those in her care homes, those in her community who, for example, have lost universal credit, been let down during the pandemic. And uh, she's passionate about that. And her criticism of the Prime Minister and uh, his cabinet is their failure to address the needs of those who are the most vulnerable in our society. But Angela speaks in the way Angela speaks, not language that I would use. Yeah, it's inappropriate though, isn't it, Mr Mayor? Uh, well, it's not the sort of uh, language uh, that I use. Um, but look, I mean, people speak in different ways. Uh, the key thing is to distinguish the Prime Minister, who's responsible for a lot of the policies causing real problems across the country, uh, and those uh, people across the country who we've got to persuade to lend us their vote, who may have voted Conservative in the past. Uh, I'm quite clear this week is our opportunity to engage with the country, to explain to them not only are we an effective opposition, but we're a government in waiting. Um, you're going to use your speech today at a party conference in Brighton um, um, to try to unite all factions of the party. I mean, isn't that something that the party's been trying to do for the best part of a decade? Well, I spent yesterday at that conference, and as you can know from my hoarse voice, I was up quite late last night and early this uh, morning. We're in good spirits. Uh, the key thing is to remind ourselves that we've got to be united. We've got to stick together uh, to win the next uh, general election. Uh, Keir's got his rule changes through yesterday, really important. Rachel Reeves is also speaking uh, uh, today, setting out our reform of business rates, the system that's broken. I'll be setting out today our plans to address both the twin emergencies of climate emergency and the uh, air pollution. We're going to be announcing a retrofit revolution to insulate our homes to address the issue of fuel poverty, but also creating jobs in the process and address the issue of climate change and energy inefficiency. You're talking about uniting. I mean, Andy Burnham, he's uh, been speaking on the fringe of party conference. He says that he feels that uh, Sakir has been sidelining uh, northern metro mayors from the party conference. What would you say to him? Well, I was with Andy Burnham, uh, Steve Rotherham, uh, last night, uh, united with my friends from uh, uh, the north. Uh, look, I, I've not seen the comments you're, you're talking about, but I, I know Andy's somebody who supports the leader. Andy's somebody who's got a huge run of experience in government, uh, as a member of parliament, and now as a brilliant mayor in uh, Manchester. And one of the things that Keir is doing, and the top team, is talking to the likes of Mark Drakeford, running Wells, but also mayors across the country from uh, Tracy Brabin, Steve Rotherham, uh, Andy Burnham, Dan Jarvis, many other mayors across the country, Marvin Rees, uh, and indeed myself, to listen to our points of view, because we are a good example of Labour in power delivering real change. OK. Let me just ask you, slightly off topic, but we had Amir Khan on the programme a few moments ago. He says he was thrown off a plane, an American Airlines plane, a week after 9-11, basically because they were two brown boys at the front of the plane uh, a week after 9-11. Uh, perception is reality. That was his view. Um, it's a challenge, isn't it? Yeah, I have problems uh, going to America, being stopped at the airport longer than colleagues I were with who aren't uh, brown or, or, or Muslim. It's been a big issue for some time, this issue of racial profiling. Not just, by the way, in America, in other places across the uh, globe. I think it's really good for Amir to talk about his experiences. One of the good things since the uh, election of the new president uh, in America, President Biden, is some of the toxicity uh, from President Trump's uh, time has now hopefully gone. One of the things we've got to do is to make sure we speak out when we feel we've been treated uh, uh, wrongly. And one of the things I'm pleased that Amir's done is speak out about, about his experiences because not everyone is a former world champion. Not everyone is Olympic medalist. Not everyone has a platform. And by people like Amir talking about it, hopefully it makes uh, those in authority in America realise that it's not really on. And what it does, by the way, is it makes people like Amir and others who love America have a sort of wear taste in their mouth and a sort of unhappiness with that great country. That's why it's really important uh, for people not to be judged by the colour of their skin or the god they worship.
OK. It, it's good to talk to you. Good luck with your speech today. Thank you. Thanks, Kay. Stay safe. Thanks. You too. More on the fuel crisis coming up in just a second.